is that all fake news? Is it like the, the 5 a.m. fake news or should we be waking up early if we're gonna be successful? Communication is always the one element where employees want to see more communication. Is that the right approach, Luke? Am I tackling this the right way? Should I be empowering my team to replace themselves with AI? The hype was so strong that AI was going to be like building houses in a year. Okay, the hype was like that it's so exponential. Was there ever a CEO you were working with that really surprised you? There's always been automation in all industries. What it means is it just means more efficiency, more throughput and more production. So we're just gonna get more of the stuff we want. All right, boys and girls, we've got Luke Peters in the house, very well accomplished CEO, uh, high eight figure exit with his company, New Air. And is this true? 600 million in cumulative sales? That's not bad. That's not, yeah, bad. not bad. Not bad. Not, not bad, Mark, from a guy who, you know, my first job was flipping donuts at the family donut shop. Not too shabby. So we're going to get into it today and we're going to really talk. The two things I really want to dig into here on how AI is impacting CEOs and leaders how it's going to change our organizational structures. And then uh, that's going to lead into the organizational structure piece and how we can build out a team, the systems, and the organization that's necessary to get to that high eight-figure exit. So Luke, I hope you're ready. Viewers, I hope you're ready as well. So Luke, let me start here. I was at a conference recently, uh, Patrick Pitt David's vault conference here in South Florida. And one of the biggest questions, one of the biggest angsts that I heard amongst business leaders was AI, is terrifying my entire staff. My entire staff is terrified. So what do you say to a CEO who's already got a system in place, things are churning, and all of a sudden his team is like, AI is here, am I gonna lose my job? How should a CIO, CEO handle AI in the workplace? Sure, yeah, and Mark, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I would say, well, first let's take a step back. You know, the CEO's job is obviously, you know, vision and execution, but communication, right? So if the team is uncertain about that, that that's probably a communication challenge. So, so you got to, you know, really think about that. How's the company communication? Make sure that everybody knows, you know, if they're doing a great job showing that and that they're valued and um, communication in any CEO survey I've ever done in my company and other companies that I've seen, it's like communication is always the one element where employees want to see more communication. Okay. It's like even the CEO leadership thinks they're doing a good job and you go survey, okay, how are our benefits? How's your wage? Well, then wages are always a little bit lower too because everybody wants more wages, but like, how's the benefits? How's the culture? How, you know, am I appreciated? How are my work hours? How's communication? Communication is almost always one of the lowest ones, okay? So if your team is is feeling that first, it's probably a communication issue. I mean, if you're, if, you know, you're not going to lay off marketing people. I mean, you got to make sure your team knows you're on a growth phase or these, this is your strategic vision. This is where you're going. And then as far as, um, you know, how to, you know, if that, if you're still doing that and there's a fear, which I, I'm, I'm serious that I think even just simple communication would remove that fear. But if there is a fear, then roll them into AI. Like, you know, anybody at almost any creative position should have, you know, a chat GPT paid account by the company or, or maybe a perplexity account, okay? Because both of them are incredible research tools, incredible um, creative tools. Anybody touching copy should have those. Um, anybody touching content should have those. Uh, and I think when you do that, then what you're you know you're showing your team, hey guys, you know it's only twenty bucks, right? I think I don't know if the corporate accounts are charged differently, but it may be like twenty bucks per seat. So it's super inexpensive to get your team on, and I think that would uh, dispel the fears. Yeah, get him, get him into it. You know, it's kind of funny you talk about over communication. The same conference, uh, Will Gadara was there. He's the writer. He was the um, the founder and head of the number one restaurant in the world in New York, and he wrote Unreasonable Hospitality. And he said, when it comes to communication, uh, and specifically with vision, communicate the vision, communicate the vision, communicate the vision. When you're sick of communicating the vision, you probably need to do some more communication of the vision. So I just find it interesting that I'm starting to see this thread kind of roll out amongst uh, what successful CEOs are doing is over communicating that vision. Yeah, no, I've always believed in that. And, and, and in fact, sometimes I was like annoying. I'm telling people the same thing all the time, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, or there, or even on marketing copy, right? You know, you're designing something and then it's, a, it's like, okay, I want, you know, this is the key point. This is our position. And then it's, it's in one spot. And I'm like, well, put it in, four, you know, why isn't it over there? Well, it's already over there. I go, yeah, but okay, uh, you know, 
the consumer may not see it there, right? <laughs> you want to make sure they see it. It's got to be in like four different areas. So it's the same thing with communication. You have to be redundant. You got to, you know, I don't know. So I don't know if it's true, but you know, it's like you, if you, if you give somebody praise, you know, you got to give them, you know, seven times more praise than you do, you know, uh, improvement ideas or, you know, people take that differently, right? The, the strength of you know, if you're giving them some constructive criticism. So I think it's the same thing here. Communication is super important. Yeah, I'm with you there. Have you ever been working with C with a CEO and they actually tattooed the vision on their body? Have you ever seen that before? Yeah, I haven't <laughs> seen that one. That is pretty funny though. <laughs> There's no, no change in that. that. That's a challenge to all you, you CEOs out there in the audience. You know, if you really want to take it to the next level and really over communicate, maybe consider the vision. I guess the challenge with that though is vision changes over time, right? Um, you know, and if if you're going towards a, if you're a seven figure business owner, you're trying to go to that eight figure exit. It feels like there's an evolution that has to happen with within both uh, yourself as a leader, uh, with your your team, your organization, but also that vision, right? So how do we how do we make that shift? What have you seen that works? Are there any processes that you see that works, Luke? From saying, okay, I've gotten to the seven figure mark, getting to eight figure is going to require some sort of mindset shift, team shift. What were the the biggest success factors you've seen? Well, okay, so there, there's a couple different ways that happens. Sometimes people just have an amazing product, right? So their their product was just so good, you know, and that and that's taking them there. And and other people, you know, other companies have to work at it, you know, like we had to at New Air. I mean, it, we were selling really fun appliances, but we didn't have specialized IP or anything that just took us there on a rocket ship. And what I've noticed is that you know the founder usually is the creative vision of the company. Okay. And then what I've seen is after a while, you know, there's usually like a growth phase and then there's sort of a leveling off. Okay. And it's, and to me, it's because the founder is now doing a lot of things they really don't or shouldn't really be doing. And they're probably really not that good at them either. Right. A lot of these um, managerial things that you can hire incredible, you know, more organized managers to run. Okay. You're the founder, you're the creative juice. And then the creative juice is sucked up doing all of these um, you know, regu regulatory things, tax things, uh, HR things, all of these things that are important, definitely important. Um, they're more urgent for the company, but let's say maybe they're not as important long term, right? If you go, if you think of Stephen Covey's um, design on that, and 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 kind of like the four boxes that he puts things in. So you want to stick with the important ideas, okay? And they're not necessarily the urgent ideas. So that's that. And then the other thing is like. Uh, you know, who you're around, right? Uh, you know, I, the, the common phrase you'll hear, you're the average of the five people you hang out with. Okay, so there's a lot of times I've joined different masterminds and they're great, incredible masterminds, right? But sometimes like you can't get too comfortable. You don't want to be in the same group for like 10 or 15 years, I don't think. I think it's, you should be jumping, okay? Um, I always remember a really smart friend, a lot smarter than me, okay? He grew an incredible marketing company and uh, I was at a conference one time and I think maybe we were 20 million at the time, you know, this is years ago and there were different rooms. Okay. If your company was like 10 to 20 million, you go in there and you meet those CEOs. And if it was like, you know, the next level and, and then and the next one up was like 50 million and above. And I'm like, well, okay, well there's the 20 million group. I guess I've got, he's like, what are you talking about, dude? You got to go into this group. I go, but I'm only 20 million. He's like, but you want to be 50 million. So, yeah. and I'm like, duh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking too logically on that. Um, so I think, you, you, I think it just comes back to your creativity. Okay. You got to, you know, every year when you do your financial or, or your strategic planning, which a lot of companies, unfortunately don't do. Okay. Right. They, you know, you get into this, um, mouse uh, trap, you know, the, the, this little exercise machine where you're just spinning around and you got to have, you know, game changing ideas every single year. You got to really sit down and say, okay, what are my transformative ideas? You may not hit them, but you need to be swinging for those. Right. Um, and I think a lot of times everybody's just kind of swinging for singles and doubles. So you kind of get into this stage right here and, and, you know, you kind of like, you turn from like a kid where you're excited and you got the creative juices to now you're running a business and it's, you know, you're like a parent, <laughs> you sort of, you sort of lose some of that. So I, I, I think there's a lot of different things I touched on, but, uh, hopefully, you know, you put those together and, and that's kind of my philosophy. The thing that really strikes me, Luke, is the important ideas versus the urgent ideas because the urgent ideas keep us on the hamster wheel. I've recently made a shift because I've, you know, got to level up, baby. We got to level up. So I recently made the shift of waking up much earlier, waking up, you know, 5, 5.30, join the 5 o'clock club, you know, because then I can get in a couple hours of work before the kids are awake. 
you know, and I can actually get into some deep work and I, and I feel like I'm ahead of schedule because I got to say the difference between waking up at five and waking up at eight is tremendous on the entire day. I just feel like if I'm up at, at eight, I'm just chasing my tail the entire day and I never actually make progress. But a few days of waking up at five and it's like, boom, step. Boom, step. We're actually making progress. We're getting that stuff done like the website or the the email list or the 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 lead magnet workflow, right? Like stuff actually gets done. I know you were surfing this morning, but what's what's your kind of like recommended wake up routine? Is that is that all fake news? Is it like the the five AM fake news or should we be waking up early if we're gonna be successful? No, well, you know what? I would say everybody's different. So I, I, I mean, obviously, you know, for years and years, I'm on the same train waking up early. I still wake up pretty early, you know, six, six thirty. Um, I think it's more actually you said a really important term, you know, deep work. Okay. So I don't know if you're familiar or if your listeners are familiar with Cal Newport, but he wrote a book called deep work. Okay. And this is like, so years ago, um, another book by Tim Ferriss called the four hour work week was super famous. Okay. And I always got made fun of for reading the book <laughs> and I trust me, I never worked four hours, but it's more about sort of the theme that you're picking up with it. The theme was automation. Okay. For Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss, that was sort of his thing was like automate things in your life and in your business. And, um, with, with Cal Newport, it's about deep work. Okay. So what you're, you know, another way that he would probably describe what you're talking about is like in two, what you get done in two hours, probably most people would take them four five, six hours. That's kind of his theme. Like if you get focused work, you don't have to work 10 hours a day if you don't want to, but you do need to have probably four hours of very focused work where you're not just responding to emails or social, like you're actually, first of all, you hopefully have a system where, where you have your high priorities and every day you're working on your highest high priorities at least two hours a day is, is the system that I follow. So for me, I just call it, you know, it's real generic. I just call it MIT's most important things, right? So we should all have our MIT's and, and those should be, you know, mid to long range focused. They don't have to be, they don't have to be the 10 year MIT, but they should lead up to that. Right. Um, and so I think that. Uh, everybody's different on kind of when they wake up I, and I've seen all kinds of successful people get up at different times. But the one thing is they're like, when they work on something, they're super focused, they're maniacal about it. And I think that's the difference maker. How do you separate that personally? You know, when you were scaling your business from seven to eight figures, how did you, how did you separate the, um, the really important work? How did you prioritize that? Was that like the first thing you did during the day? Was it like, these are the non-negotiables for the week, for the month? How, how did you kind of separate that when you made your jump from seven to eight figures? Sure. Okay. So, okay. The, the thing is like it, you, the founder, you know, your business that that's the most important thing that people have to realize because you're getting advice all the time, you know, and it, it, it's, uh, just on a quick tangent, like my daughter, my oldest daughter starting a business and she's crushing it, you know, and she knows her business so well, like I will talk, we'll give advice, but I'm like, I'm like, you know, your business, you know, your customer. So meaning when you're working on your business, you're getting advice, you know, even your employee, they're, they, they're well-meaning, okay? But they don't see into the future like you do as the business owner. Mm. So the first thing is you got to like, you have to have some quiet time, okay? So that literally that's what I call it, quiet time. So you have to have some thinking time and you come up with these things and I would do it at the end of the day, okay? So I would do it, you know, before I went home, okay, here's my things I got to get done. Some of them were short-term things. They were, they were just like to-do things, but then uh, it's always going to have my MITs on there. And the other thing is you have to be careful to, um, it's very difficult actually, because you, you have to take, you want to take your team's advice because you want to build leaders at your team. But when it comes to the vision, it's like, I really believe the entrepreneur is going to know the best vision. Okay. Otherwise you're going to get help uh, because most people don't think as long-term as you're going to think. Okay. Right. They don't have the skin in the game. Like you have the skin in the game. So that, that's how I would do it. You know, I think it works well for most people. Yeah. Like, and by the way, I do the same thing at night. You know, my, my brain is kind of fr fried at night. I'm like, you know, I just going to chill out with the wife for a little while. But I will say that what I do is I, I write down a quick list of things so that as soon as I wake up in the morning, I know, boom, this is what I'm, I'm diving into right away. Uh, I don't want to waste any time in the morning figuring out. And I find that that's, I don't know if th this impacts other people, but I find that when I'm not sure what to do, I tend not to do anything because yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You need something to, it's like, it's like your, it's like your, your directions, right? It's like you're, you know, you're going to a destination and okay, you got to make a right. You got to make a left. And that, that's kind of what your to-do list is. 
Exactly. Because you can get like paralysis by analysis. You wake up in the morning like, okay, I've got the emails and I've got this client I got to get back to and that client and then this team member. And then, oh, I got to review the finances for the, for the week. And it's all of a sudden you're like frozen. Right. But by the end of the day, I always have like an agenda of things that I wanted to get done, but I couldn't get to, or things that have been kind of pending and I can put, I can write those down. Um, although I will say those post-its when things don't get done, it's really hard to throw out those post-its. Cause I'm like, oh, then if I throw out that post it, the work's just never going to get done. Because, yeah. You know, yeah, you, get, you, see. you get these posts, it's all over the place. I don't know if anyone else can empathize with that, but I get that going on. Um, all right, cool. So I, I do actually want to segue a little bit back to AI because I think this is a really important topic. Um, so we, we mentioned that we want to over communicate with our team, let them know that you need to be using AI. One of the things that I've actually encouraged my, my staff to do is try to replace themselves. And it sounds counterintuitive at once, but I was talking to a team member the other day. I'm like, listen, you need to be using AI. Here's a subscription to MidJourney. Here's a subscription to ChatGPT. Here's a subscription to, to this, to this, to this. I want you to figure out how to replace yourself. You're saying that it's going to take you five hours to do it. How can you do it in five minutes? That's what I want you to solve. But then he comes back. He's like, well, I don't know. He's kind of like, I don't know if I can figure it out. Is that the right approach, Luke? Am I tackling this the right way? Should I be empowering my team to replace themselves with AI? I, I love that idea. It, 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 I see how, how it could be scary. I think that um, the way I always talked about it is, I, you know, if I'm working with somebody, because now, you know, you, you know, it's a it's a global economy, even on the on the workforce, right? And um, if you know you want something done creatively, okay, and somebody's going to know the customer. You're going to need, you know, an American to do that. Okay. You need somebody right here. So I don't think they, they should be fearing for the jobs. I think more, it's sort of like, look, I want to elevate you. Okay. I, you know, I have these contractors who are managing our advertising. We got this other groups who, who's managing our PR. And right now, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say it this way, but right now, maybe they're doing this low task of sort of like basic content production, whatever, whatever they're doing. Right. And you want to move them up the chain and usually got to hire you know, someone to do usually hire contractors because they have like direct experience and they're experts in these areas. And maybe your team isn't quite there yet, but that that's a nice approach to sort of elevate them and then hire in under them or use AI for that. Right. That that's usually like if you're going to outsource, you know, with like executive assistant type of work, you can usually bring that in. But when you need that skilled work, you need people here. So I think, you know, there's always been automation in all industries. Um, what it means is it just means more efficiency, more throughput and more production. So we're just going to get more of the stuff we want. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, people end up losing all their jobs. I don't think that's the route that that companies are going right now. But I, I do think that the people that don't adapt and learn the new skills will lose their jobs and um, kind of looking at all the dock workers out there trying to go on strike saying no automation, no robots. We don't want them. They are coming, people. Exactly. Yeah, that that's kind of the message. The message is that the jobs have to change, right? It's like, you don't need to lose your job, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. If somebody's, if somebody's, it's the same thing that happened, you know, during the dot com bust and through the whole sort of digitata digit digitata digitation, <laughs> I can't pronounce that one right. But, you know, the whole rollout of computers, it's like people who didn't adapt, okay? And they kind of had the older skills, they're still there, but like all the new jobs, you know, are kind of attached to a computer you know, in the late nineties and, and early two thousands. And, and so it's, a, it's this, it'll be this similar type of thing with AI. I actually, you know, there, there was a lot of hype. I was really following AI close and I still do, you know, and there's a lot of podcasts I was listening to. And um, it's interesting because like the hype was so strong that uh, AI was going to be like building houses in a year. Okay. The hype was like that. It's so exponential. Okay. But now what's happening. Okay. What's happening is these new models take so much power to run that the the change from one model of ChatGPT to the next one, like each new run to go to the next version of ChatGPT is like, I don't know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And then and that actually is squared or 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 even exponential to the next one, right? They're like boom, boom, boom. So it's gonna be it, it it's it's happening and everybody's aware of it and everybody needs to adapt to it, but I don't I don't, I think it's, you know, it's still going to take time. It's not going to be this overnight thing that was sort of, uh, you know, discussed maybe a year or two ago. Yeah. 
so I don't disagree, but I don't want to. So I was talking to some the other day and they, they said to me, Mark, um, I know working out's important. Exercise is going to be really important. I need to be exercising. I'm not feeling good. I need to do it. So what I did is I went to the, but he's like, but I'm on it. It's done. And I said, okay, cool. You know, he's like, yeah, I start in three weeks. I have a trainer. I'm going to go to the gym. And I'm like, <clears throat> you've acknowledged that it's important. You're going to start in three weeks. Is that, that's, that's the plan. He's like, and he kind of thought about it for a sec. And he's like, yeah, because I think, and I kind of explained to him and I, you kind of see this in, in the, you know, the marketing world, the sales world is that we, um, if it, in his case, he had a psychological loop that he had closed, right? It was open. I need to exercise, scheduled my gym membership, closed. I'm done. I can move on to the next task. But what was interesting, he hadn't actually done anything. And so my fear with uh, business owners and CEOs when it comes to AI is they're going to say, oh, yeah, it's it's I. I'll, I'll give my guys chat GPT and then, you know, closed loop. But I don't think it stops there. I, I, I think that you cannot close the loop yet because, as you had mentioned, things are changing very quickly. There's exponential growth. There's, you know, there's you know, we might be one lithium battery away or one nuclear power plant away from this thing exploding into a not, I don't like putting the words nuclear explosion right next to it, but we could be close to uh, some sort of exponential growth in this AI market, call centers, AI call centers, um, AI sales staff, uh, robots in homes, like things can move pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. No, they they already are. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so I don't want to diminish that. I guess what I'm saying is, is, Maybe it's just my assumption. The CEO should never slow down, but you're right. Too many people get too comfortable. I, there, there's a book called, uh, Andy Grove wrote a book, very you know, famous guy from Silicon Valley who's a uh, Intel CEO. And he wrote a book called, uh, it was called Only the Paranoid Survive. Okay, so I subscribe by that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm a, I'm a happy guy, but I'm saying like in the back of your mind as a CEO, you got to be a little bit paranoid, like a healthy amount, right? You can't be too relaxed and too happy with where you are uh, so I subscribe to that philosophy where basically, you know, e every day, you know, someone might eat your breakfast. You got to wake up and, and just be ready to roll every single day. Yeah. Well, especially if you're moving to that eight figure mark, that's going to be, that's going to be necessary. There's always someone that's trying to eat your lunch when you're trying to go for that type of market share. Um, okay. Quick question for you. So you, you, you scaled, you exited your love in life, but you decide to, you know what? I want to give back. I want to help the next generation, the next generation of CEOs and entrepreneurs come up. So you start Apex CEO. What was it like working with your first client? Well, it's it, the funny thing is I, I was working with people before I even started it. And that, that's why I started it. So, you know, I'm advising friends and, uh, and you know, n none of them paid at the time, but of course not, you know, just friends and, and, and even some people who weren't friends, just people who I just met on LinkedIn. So it was just, uh, it, it, it was actually really fulfilling. Because um, there's, you know, when you're a business owner, you know, we all kind of think we're sort of in this box, okay, you know, or, or sometimes you have that imposter syndrome. But listen, I mean, if you've been doing this long enough, every, everybody listening is going to have some really important skills that they can share with somebody else. Even people who aren't new themselves, okay, they might be strong in one area, but maybe they need to overcome other challenges. Usually it's around people is what I found. So those are the areas, um, uh, thinking about your team, cause you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have a good team. Okay. It's like, um, unless you want to just stay as a sort of a lifestyle business and a cash flow business, but if you want to scale, you have to have a team and you have to have a really, really good team. Okay. And think like in a, in a sports mindset, you know, like you're going to be the Lakers during Jerry bus years, you know, you're just going to go get the best people on your team. That's how you're going to do it. And so that's, that's generally, um, the, the first place to start, you know, that and kind of strategic vision. And it's very, very fulfilling. It's a lot of fun, actually. Dig that. And like we said, we want to do things we enjoy. Who Was there ever a CEO you were working with that really surprised you? Oh, yeah, for sure. Usually, you know what the biggest surprise is? Is like some of these companies that you, they, they don't. Okay, they're, they're, they're companies that are sort of a non-traditional company and they're making a lot of profit. Okay. A lot of profit. And they themselves sort of just like, they just know their business, you know? And I'm like, well, they're crushing it. Even if their top line's not that big, right? Maybe they're like one of them that I know is, is about, is about three or 4 million, but they're putting like a million to the bottom line, uh, which, you know, 25% net profit when you, in a, 
in a commercial business, when you have employees, I mean, you know, that's significant. So, um, and, and there a couple other examples like that. So that's kind of fun to see those. Even I learned, you know, I'm like, wow, this is like, <laughs> okay, you know, you, there's a lot of other areas we can work on, but like, your, what you did to this product and how you found these customers and this moat you got in, it's like, don't change that part. So I, I, I think, you know what the message there, Mark, is like if people have a business and they're, and they're doing well, sometimes they're too hard on, on themselves, you know? And, and it's like, and take a step back and like be proud of like what you created. Because sometimes, you know, business owners don't do enough of that. You know, you're kind of like always, you know, looking for the next win, um, but it can be, you know, you got to take a step back and appreciate kind of, you know, how you got to where you are and what you got. Very easy to do that. I don't know if you've read, um, the gap, the gap and the game by Ben Hardy, but, um, there's this inclination that we have as, as humans and as, as business owners to compare ourselves versus where we wish we were, where we want to be, um, versus comparing ourselves against where we, where we were in the past. Right. So, Comparing yourself to where you were five years ago is kind of the gain uh, versus the gap, which is, oh, if only I had achieved this number or achieved this level of success or gotten that girl or whatever, right? But when you when you compare versus uh, the past, uh, it, it it incentivizes gratitude in, as opposed to that. Some really negative things that can come. That's a great message. Yeah, we're in a comparison world, you know, social media. So it's so that's a great message. Yeah, we talk about distractions. I don't even know how you don't get distracted with your phone bleeping and blipping you all the time. It's it's a wild world that we're living in, but the opportunities are great. The opportunities are great. All right, listen, y'all, we've been talking with the man, the myth, the legend, Luke Peters. Here on the After Hours Entrepreneur, you can check him out at apexceo.co, or I would definitely recommend you check out his YouTube channel, which is Fired Up. Some great videos there, some great stories there. That's where I want to send you. So go to YouTube, links below, check it out. Uh, Luke, thanks for joining the show here today. Thanks, Mark. Enjoyed it.